Two months ago was the Miss America pageant. Long-legged, luscious ladies loitering about on stage. How was a judge to choose? That question was posed to the judges shortly after Miss America was crowned. How did you choose your leading lady? The answer was unanimous. It was a single word, and that word was confidence. They judged the ladies by their confidence. Didn't matter the bikini or the bupki or the bustle or the bazoombas. It was all about what's inside that counts. And that's darn good news for those of us who are not beauty pageant queens. <laughs> <laughs> and that is the topic and that is the nucleus of this presentation is confidence, building confidence on stage. We'll get right to it as a matter of fact. I was, uh, when I grew up, I grew up in the mountains and we had lots of skiing and I was a giant slalom skier. And I had a little lady as my instructor, her name was Brownie. And Brownie lived up to her name. She was short, she was square, and she was very brown from having skied a great deal. And she would look up at me and she'd say, Christine, when I get through with you, you're going to know every inch of your boards, meaning my skis. But the subtext was, I want you to be safe, I want you to be comfortable, and I want you to have fun. This morning, I would echo Brownie's words to you. When I get through with you, <laughs> you're going to know every inch of your boards. And the subtext is still the same. I want you to be safe, I want you to feel comfortable, and I want you to have a good time. So let's get started. When it comes to knowing your boards, I literally mean know your boards. Come to the venue before you are asked to speak and get to know your stage. Know how deep it is. Know how wide it is. What kind of presentation are you giving? And where will you be standing? Where will you deliver those last lingering words? In the World Championships of Public Speaking, I would get up at 5 or 5.30 in the morning, take off my shoes, and I would literally walk the stage so I would know every inch of my boards. Once you know where your boards are and you can begin to develop an idea of where you're going to stand and begin some of that creative visualization of being a successful speaker, of standing with poise and courage. That was, is all before you even come up here. The second thing that happens in knowing your boards is you get to know your backdrop. And if you know your backdrop, you'll know what you're going to wear. Right? <laughs> what a novel idea. But that's also part of the creative visualization process is seeing yourself and what you're going to wear. In the 2005 World Championships, all the men showed up wearing black suits and it was a black backdrop and all you got to see were these little white heads. <laughs> I think that's why I won. I was just up a bunch of white-headed guys, you know? So know your backdrop. Another situation, if you're a person of color. I was with a man from Africa in 2010. He was one of the people I was competing with. He came with two suits. One was black and one was white. And he said, as a man of color, I cannot wear a white suit with a black white background because I look like a dotted eye. <laughs> the internationally accepted color is blue. This is the perfect Toastmaster dress, by the way. And if you're a woman, please wear a dress. It's a great opportunity to use a little skullduggery and use our legs to get that extra point bonus for that World Championships <laughs> award. So wear a dress. This is a great, actually, stage costume. It's not a dress, it's a stage costume. And uh, it's the right color. It slightly has enough knit to make it interesting. And all these buttons hide my d distinguished Toastmaster buttons button right here. So I get to wear it in camouflage kind of a thing. So now you, you, you've got to know your stage, you know what you're going to wear, and now you're about to be called on. What are you going to do before you're called on? 
The first thing you're going to do is you're going to stand. Always stand before you are called on. This includes evaluations or speeches or big fat presentations. Stand before you're called on. Several things are going to happen for you when that occurs. The first is you're going to start to self-regulating. Your heart, that terrible pounding that you feel <laughs> in your chest, will start to regulate as you are standing. Another thing that will happen is it will give you the opportunity to look at your audience and begin to connect with them. Begin to see who's in your audience, practice your eye contact, practice your smiles, and get a chance to interact with your audience before you even meet with them. How many introverts are in the room this morning? Oh, just a few of us. <laughs> I'm not raising my hand just to get you to raise yours. I'm a card-carrying member of Introverts Anonymous, and my life is unmanageable when I get introverted. But the thing of it is, for us as introverts, it's very hard for us to smile. We have a tendency to get really deep in our thoughts, you know. And it was always the uh, speakers forum or heart-to-heart -to -heart Toastmasters, people like Ashley Harpness or Tevis Thompson, who would be sitting in the wings going, yee, yee, you know, trying to get me to smile. I was like, God, why are you? And I was like, why are you doing that? Oh, you want me to smile? Oh, OK. <laughs> I get it. All right. But that, that, that positive atmosphere occurs when you smile, because sometimes we can't think our way into right acting. Sometimes we have to act our way into right thinking, and the smile helps. And lastly, what I would comment on is if you're in a seated position, say where our Fred Todd Henry is, and, I, and he's called up, if he's not standing here, he has to go through all these people to get up here, and people are only going to clap for so long, right? <laughs> so then he comes up here to a dead audience. He comes up, and he has missed the most important thing that he should have had, which is the opportunity to receive his applause. That's the gift that you give to us as speakers, and you as the audience need to see that we receive it. Lastly, what I wanted to say while you're standing there, women, I want you to listen up now. Women have a tendency when we stand here to do one of these, <laughs> or one of these. <laughs> I think it's from modeling. We want to, you know, look really thin. But you can't give a speech that way very well, can you? I don't think so. So <laughs> what I want you to learn to do, and you can do it in the post office while you're standing in line or in the grocery line, learn to stand powerfully. Learn to stand with your feet directly below the shoulders for confidence. Women have, and with this kind of thing that we do, it's hard to put our trust in someone who's kind of in an ergonomy look, okay? So stand tall, and it gives you an opportunity to breathe and feel the, the air, your posture, get yourself organized. And now you're about to be called on. Oh my God, now what am I gonna do? So two things. Actually, I'm going to need a little help from our audience. Would you mind coming up and, and uh, being a little demonstrator with me? Come on up here. Well, please welcome uh, Patty. Welcome, welcome. Now, she, <laughs> yeah, now show them how to stand, baby. <laughs> All right. Now, she's my MC. We're going to have you stand there for this time. She's my MC. She's calling me. Women, Sophia Loren, okay? <laughs> we're going to walk like we're going to own this stage, right? Not too much, but you know what I'm saying. Okay, we're gonna, now what you're going to do is we're going to come up and shake her hand. Handshaking, <laughs> handshaking came from 4,000 years ago with the Roman generals who would meet you know, prior to having dinner. And whoever had the upper hand got to win the dinner for the day, all right? That's where getting the upper hand came from, is actually from handshaking. Another uh, phrase was up your sleeve, something up your sleeve. If I'm like this, it was not easy for me to hide a dagger or a dirk or something and poke her with it, right? So there's nothing up my sleeve. Right? Now, and, and of course, there was men, and they were squatting, and they were being very masculine. But today, we're very feminine, and we're going to do it differently. 
So when I come in, now the audience is seeing what's happening. And when I come in, I'm going to come in at a 90 degree angle, maybe a little more, get that upper hand, shake her hand, and now I'm going to move her off the stage and assume the stage. No bumper cars up here. We'll try it again. This time I'm coming to you. Coming, I'm going to fall off the stage. No, I'm coming to you. Okay, now we're going to come up. I'm going to give her my hand, 90 degree angle, good strong grip, not, not, not where she's crying, but, but a nice grip, and then I'm going to move her behind me and assume the stage. A lot of us don't know how to assume the stage and allow the person to go ahead and move off. Make sense? Okay. Thank you, Patty. We'll give, it, give our handshake a, a round of applause. And now you're at the lectern. What are you going to do once you reach the lectern? <laughs> the boundless seas of Toastmasters, army hearties. <laughs> first thing you do is absolutely nothing. The first thing you do is you take in your audience. And the audience, as I take it in quietly and silently and have the courage to be quiet, everyone else settles down too. And it's sort of like what I call the global brain. It's like all of you become a personality to me. And that personality sees everything that I'm doing, from the strength of my handshake to how I walk across the floor. This is the global brain that's watching. And you saw me take my time and allow Diane, our Toastmaster, to get her seat, get her comfortable, and then we go into our presentation. This particular presentation I'm giving today is not going to address your speech, but it will continue further with building blocks on how to walk, project your voice, use vocal variety and eye contact so that you can put those in your speech. So let's go ahead. I'm going to take it from toe to head of what we can do to, again, build those building blocks for self-confidence on stage. Okay. So let's start with the feet. When you walk, walk with purpose. Usually what happens for me as a speaker is I start talking with someone and I just naturally want to complete my conversation with you. And then I feel like someone might be feeling neglected over there and I kind of start talking with someone over there. And that that's what usually allows me to move forward, is my interest in you as a person. If I want you to agree with me, I nod my head and I start walking. See, you're lovely. I like you. <laughs> want to buy some real estate? <laughs> yeah. But if you want them to do something, and, and this way is even better, back and forth is really good. Not side to side, but this is a very powerful move to come forward. And so if I want power, if I want to demonstrate confidence, I'm going to come forward smiling and yeah. And that's how you get the audience to get in that positive mode with you is when you're smiling and talking, they're smiling and talking. Then you have, again, that ability to have that ease and comfort up here that you've been looking for. Now we'll move into hand gestures. Most women have a tendency to do this. And I was going down the road, kind of like the chicken. And we need to learn to raise our hands up. Some women have a tendency to do the cross your heart thing. I feel this so deeply. Oh, yeah? No, I don't think so. We want hands above the waist to be credible. They must be above the waist. Next, it just depends on what you want to do with your fingers to impact your presentation. If I were to ask you to do something with my hands kumsa, you are more likely to do it as opposed to this way and you will do it that way and then there's the pointy finger thing. Ah, 
bad pointy finger, uh, which really gets you absolutely nowhere. What you want is for people to join you. You want them to join you. If Hitler had, instead of saying Sig Heil, went Sig Heil, I don't think anybody would follow that guy. But if you want someone to follow you, yeah, that's how you're going to get them to follow you. But it just depends on where are you putting your hands for effect. Digits in alignment, think Hillary Clinton. <laughs> Hillary's got the hand thing down. She knows her hands. And again, the hands are above the waist. Now we'll move into eye contact. And I'm going to ask our little friend Patty to come up one more time and, and be our eye contact person. Come on one more time. <laughs> Welcome. Nice handshake. <laughs> OK. For eye contact, you do not have to do the Hoover method. That's where you kind of vacuum everybody up and try to take everybody in. No, this is not going to work. I don't think so. So what we'll be doing is the five second rule. What you do is you kind of look into the audience for five seconds softly. And then you move to another area of the audience and then to another area of the audience. Now audience, I want you to help our little friend Patty. And I'm going to count down five seconds. And you will raise your hands when that five seconds is up. So th the audience knows what five seconds really looks like, OK? It feels like forever, but it's not. OK, now pick, a, pick an area. Where are you going to pick? Over there? All right. All right. One, two, three, four, five. See how, see, see how that looks? All right, now, now let's try this, this area of the, of the audience now. Just go ahead. Now, nice soft gaze. One, two, three, four, five. Yeah. See, that's, that's how, you want to try another one? No. Oh, OK. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right, well, thank you, Patty. <laughs> That is what eye contact looks like. A lot of us have no idea what five seconds feels like. And I thought that that might be useful for us to take a look and see how long is a five second look into an audience and then move on. We'll move from here into vocal variety. Vocal variety. A man speaks at approximately 125 to 127 words per minute. The fastest speaking man recorded was John F. Kennedy, who could speak at approximately 133, almost 135 words per minute without a mistake, without an um or an ah uh or anything like that. That man was brilliant. This is important information for us to know because a woman speaks at 135 to 137 words per minute. This is probably why men think that women are a little testy all the time. We're not testy, we're just talking fast. <laughs> and then when we get up here, whoa, and then we get all excited and we start talking and it seems like we're on a 75 minute run. Blah, 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 blah. So ladies, slow down. And the other thing that happens when we get excited is it tends to get a little nasally. I remember I was in the speakers forum and Brendan Fraser came up to me. He says, you're sounding really nasally. I said, I am not. <laughs> yes, I was. <laughs> so the lower the voice, the lower the cadence. I was in uh, telemarketing. I was, I, I was a recruiter, actually, a high-tech recruiter. And it was told to me that the women with the lower voices got the more sales, right? So I would deliberately, hello, <laughs> to the ASIC engineers in the Silicon Valley trying to get their money. Uh, but it, was, it helped a lot to know where my voice was in terms of what it was that I was trying to achieve. You want to achieve gravitas. Lower the voice, slow down, take your time up here. Okay, if you have 
an inanimate object, give it a voice. Give everything you can possibly give a voice in your presentation, give it a voice. Like, for example, my brother invited me home for Christmas. My brother called and said, Christine, we'd like to have you home for Christmas. Which one has more pizzazz? It's the one that has the vocal variety. It's the one that has the vocal variety. When you're up here, speak, don't talk. A lot of us come up here and we're going to give a little talk. And then no one can hear you. And then you don't win anything and you wonder why. <laughs> but that's because no one heard you in the first place. So one of the things that I would suggest to develop confidence and to develop that voice is to begin to start speaking to the end of the room. Start delivering your speech to the back of the room so that you know how far your voice can really travel and then in incrementally bring it back to yourself and then all of us back out again. So you know your range, know your pitch, know where your voice is coming from. The analogy that I was given and I still use to this day is birds. I think of birds lofting out of my mouth and reaching those people in the audience. Connection, 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 connection. And I just feel like there's this flow of connection, connection, connection. And, you know, when I was giving my presentation outdoors, which I usually do on a mountainside, as I was doing that, flocks of birds began to fly in front of me. And it was the most beautiful experience of realizing how birds fly and how words can also do the same thing as we just flow with one another and I reach you and you reach me in that process. We have an opportunity this morning to have a presenter from my club who is going to give a few paragraphs of her presentation. We're going to look at it using some of the building blocks that you just heard. We're going to listen to her and then we'll give her an evaluation using the building blocks and then have her give it a second time. That way, you'll have the opportunity to see both, you know, the first time and the second time using the building blocks of self-confidence that you just, just saw. So, please welcome to the stage, Sally Burr. Thank you. Hello. Yeah. Hello, all you beautiful people. I am a cat woman. I didn't really know it, but about 10 years ago, I moved into a new apartment with no roommate and no furniture. And I thought it was just great, but how would I make it a home? And I was reading through the lease, and on line 18 under no dogs, it said, you can have one cat. And I thought, yes. I would love to come home to a cat every day. So, but first, I needed furniture. So I started looking through Craigslist, through the chairs and the tables and the bookcases, and I saw Crazy Cat Lady Starter Kit. <laughs> and I thought, what could that be? And I clicked on it, and it was Tigger, single mother of five, free to a good home. So I made an appointment and got over there that day, and I sat on the floor, because I know how cats think, and she would have said, wow, you are tall. And I, she sat there and they said, you know, she really likes you. She never comes out for anyone. And uh, that flattery was really working on me. And I thought, well, I'll take her. But she's the strangest cat I've ever seen. She had really big eyes. They seemed too big for her head. She was very thin because she had just had all these kittens. And so I took her home, and she just wailed all night long and yowling and yowling. And I said, I thought you liked me. Finally, finally, she stopped in the morning. And I picked her up, and I held her, and I thought, 
You are the most beautiful cat I've ever seen. Stop. That's good. How'd that feel for you? Oh. Well, it felt great. It's a little tricky with the uh, microphone because you can't really just gesticulate as you <laughs> yeah, like. Really That's harder. fine. Yeah, it was fun. Okay. You. Um, now, using what you learned this morning, what can you give to Sally that would bring more confidence to that particular presentation? Yes. Use your board. Use your board. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, it okay. is a huge use, stage. Use the boards. Yes. Okay, eye contact for five seconds. So mm -hmm. really talk to one person for five seconds. Mm -hmm. Anything else? Yeah. Go ahead. Yes. Um, instead of leaning backwards, more lean forward, like on the space. Ah. Lean forward. Yeah. Lean forward. No. Well, <laughs> <laughs> no. Okay. Gotcha. Yeah. Yes. Slow down, darling. Slow down. Yes, I get that a lot, especially from my mother. Does the cat have a voice? Oh, could I do the yeah? Yeah, yeah. There's a hand over there, right there. Yes. Uh, my hands were Can too low. Bring them up. Maybe. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Uh huh. Vow voice louder. Okay. Okay. Like I am a cat woman. All right. Now you ready to do it again? We're going to have her do it again. Just, just what you, just what you told her. Let's see if, if we can get her to just try it on. Take her time. Step back. Slow down. Hands up. You ready? Okay. Yeah, and let her. Good butt. morning, ladies and gentlemen. I am a cat woman, and I didn't even know it. But 10 years ago, I moved into a new apartment, and for the first time, no roommate and no furniture. But how would I make it a home? Well, as I was reading through the lease, on line 18, under no dogs, it said, you can have one cat. And I thought, yes, this is so great. I haven't had a cat for 20 years. I didn't know how I'd get one, but I would. But first, I needed furniture. I was looking through Craigslist and going through the bookcases and the tables and the chairs, and I saw it right there. Crazy Cat Lady Starter Kit. <laughs> Crazy Cat Lady Starter Kit? And I opened it and it said, Tigger, single mother of five, two years old, and free to a good home. So I went over there and I sat on the floor because I know how cats think. And they, she came out and sat right beside me and we looked at each other and they said, she really likes you. You know, she never comes out for anyone. And I said, wow, that flattery is really working for me. So I decided to take her. And at least I'd know what color furniture to get. And got her home, and she just yowled all night long, and it was yow, yow. I mean, it was horrible. I just, I thought, this is so terrible. And I thought, well, in the morning when I couldn't sleep all night, I said, I think I'll take her to the Humane Society because I'll just say I just found her. And <laughs> so the minute I had that thought, she stopped yowling, and she jumped up into my lap and curled up in the sweetest little ball, and I thought, you are the most beautiful cat I've ever seen. And we just fell in love with each other. Thank you. That's cool. Wait, wait, wait. wait. Yeah. Nice job, yeah? Yes, go ahead. The use of your hands was Oh, really? Wow. Do you see a difference? Uh huh. Okay. Yeah, you, you need you need to hear how that's changed. Thank you. I I appreciated the the vocal variety with the cat. Mm. 
you know that that you get really got the audience with that. What, what else? What else did you see that she did that was different this time? Is the stage over there in the green? Oh, good. We peed those things. Yeah, yeah. Powerful dynamic start with, I am a cat woman. Cat woman! <laughs> Potentially outfit, right? Yeah. <laughs> the eye contact made you feel connected. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And Cynthia? Using those techniques really connected with us. Oh, great. Wow, thank you. Mm -hmm. You seem that you're on board of Ah. <laughs> That's important. Nice. Yeah. More fun. More fun. More fun. Can't do it. Um, oh. One thing that I thought was really Sorry. good was since you slowed down, at one point, I forget what, exactly what it was, but you said, you said something, and because you did it slower, we all started to laugh. Mm. And so you, you were getting a laugh. If you had been faster, right. you would have missed the laugh. Uh-huh. If you were slower, you would have missed the laugh. That's great. Go ahead. Yes. You said you were looking yet at the Mm. A good vignette at the end. Okay, and go ahead. More pausing. Yeah. Good. So, Wish I'd had you all before I got into my. Contest. <laughs> oh no, Mas. Here's here's another fellow. Yes. With that last presentation, you engaged the audience. Wow. And Thank you. Mm -hmm. you see how you were enjoying it, they it. Oh, cool. Your enjoyment becomes yeah. their enjoyment. I love you all. You're Isn't good. that I wonderful? Love you. <laughs> I don't think there's any, anything else, so we'll okay. let you Thank let you. you go, okay. Catwoman. Wasn't that fun? You get to see how it works and, and, and challenge yourself a little bit with this? Okay. Well, they say that last words linger. And we're coming down to my last words for you this, this morning. I wanted to say that I never planned to be a public speaker. This was never my, on my destiny. I was the one least likely to succeed and most likely to die young. <laughs> and I lived that kind of lifestyle and what changed me was something that impelled me to do things differently. That's different than propel and that's different than compel. It's an inner explosion that breaks you beyond the, your understanding of yourself. And part of that impel and implosion, if you, Im implosion, one could say, part of that included my joining Toastmasters International. It is through our program that I discovered how to step out of my comfort zone and step out of my fear. And fear, what is fear? Fear is a, a, a survival instinct where four of, one of four things are being triggered. The first is the need to know you're right, the need to feel in control, the need to feel part of, and the need to feel comfortable or habit. I would suggest that public speaking activates every single one of those triggers, doesn't it? Because when we come up here, we don't always know what we're going to do. We don't always feel comfortable. We're away from our tribe, and we don't know if it's right. So once we know what fear looks like and what's actually being activated, we can transform that fear into something else, like anticipation. When you're up here and you feel that fear coming on, Here's a couple of tricks for you that I use. One of them is called self-soothing. While you're waiting, you can spend a little time pulling on your ears or adjusting your ring. But what I'm really doing is telling myself, this is a false alarm. I will not die from this. 
But it looks like I'm adjusting my watch. <laughs> but that self-soothing helps a great deal with that fear. Another way of transforming fear is, what does fear feel like? Sweaty palms, heart palpitation, dry mouth, a little twitchy in the eye, kind of a Jackson Pollock moment, you know, where you're <laughs> like this internally, of course. And that's what fear looks like. Put it, now, we're just going to bookmark that for a second and take a look at this coming Christmas. This coming Christmas, you have the perfect present for your best friend. And you're there with them, and they're about to open your present. And it's a present you've been, you know, you've been hanging on for six months. It's the right color. It's the right size. It's what they wanted. And they're about to open that present. <gasps> what happens? Heart palpitation. Sweaty palms. A little dry in the mouth, a little ticky in the eye, kind of another moment. But this time, it's anticipation. And what we have done is we have recalibrated the fear, which is all about us, into anticipation, which is all about you. I can't wait for you to open my package. I am the package. And you come up here with that sense of, I can't wait for us to get started. That's the kind of feeling I would like to see you engendered when you come up here. You can't wait for us to open your package. What was I? It, was, it comes to mind to say to you this, I guess, in, in, in the end. I would hope that every one of you knowing what you know about me, coming from kind of the backyard line, that you too can look at me and say, if she can get up there and do that, I can too. And I do hope that every last one of us here feels impelled to come up here and stand your ground, to come up here and raise your arms and let us know what you think. And along with that, be impelled to loft your voice and connect with your audience. Be brave, be bold, be beautiful, and speak with confidence. Madam Toastmaster.